Uh, yeah, so I'll talk about analytic capacity and projections. Um, and so I should start by explaining what these are. Uh, so analytic capacity is something that um, is from complex analysis. So we start with this following definition. So a set E uh, is removable for bounded analytic functions if for every open set containing E and any al analytic function on this uh, omega minus E, uh, any bounded analytic function. I mean, um, this can be extended analytically to all of omega. So some examples are uh, if E is a single point. Right, so here's a picture of a point. Uh, if you have a set omega and then you have uh, a bounded analytic function on omega minus this point, you can extend it to omega as well. This is uh, Riemann's theorem on removable singularities. And then an example of something that is not removable is a, a disk. Because you see, if you have this full disk, so here for the full disk, you can consider the function one over z. Right? That's a bounded analytic function on the complement of the disk, um, but it can't be extended into the disk. Okay, so I guess the idea here is a point is small, a disk is large, and so somehow um, we we want to try to understand which sets are exactly removable. Is it something about their size or something else? And so this is a panel based problem. Like find a geometric way to characterize removable sets. Okay, okay so here I have the definition of uh, removable again. And so here I'm going to give you a characterization of removable sets. Uh, so it's the theorem at the bottom. Uh, so E is removable if and only if this quantity gamma of E is equal to zero. And gamma of E is defined uh, up here. Uh, so this thing is called the analytic capacity. And um, yeah, it's defined in this way. You don't actually need this definition for this talk. So you know, maybe let me just do that um, because we're not gonna use this definition anywhere inside this talk. Um, but I guess, the, oh, I guess let me do this. Yes, yeah, so don't pay attention to any part of this definition. Well, well except maybe, except maybe uh, let me point out that even though this does characterize removability, um, this definition is not geometric. You probably can't tell because you can't see it right now, but <laughs> okay, so <laughs> uh, it's a complex analytic definition, it's not geometric, so yeah, so this is not a solution to Pan Levay's question, yeah, and like I said, don't pay attention to this, okay, okay, so let's look at some things that are geometric. Um, so here are some um, sets that we know are removable or not removable. So the first two are pretty easy to show. Uh, the first one says that if you have a set of one-dimensional Hausdorff measure zero, that is removable. Okay, so you know, this generalizes the point example that I had earlier. And then the second one says that if the Hausdorff dimension is greater than one, then it's not removable. And so like, like the disk, for example. Um, okay, and then a much more non-trivial result is this third one here, which is proved by Calderon, um, which says that if, you, if E is a subset of a rectifiable curve, then removability is equivalent to having H1 measure zero. Yeah, so this is non-trivial. It uh, follows from Calderon's theorem on the uh, boundedness of the Cauchy transform on Lipschitz graphs for small Lipschitz constant. Um, and so one natural thing you can ask is, like, is this assumption really necessary? Like, do we really need this rectifiability? And it turns out that we do. Uh, okay, so here's um, the definition of removability again, and here's Calderon's theorem again. So, so this next part here says that we do need um, this hypothesis because if you take the standard four corners Cantor set, um, then it's a counterexample to the statement with this thing removed. Okay, so the, by four corner Cantor set, I mean, uh, you start with a square, you divide it into 16 smaller squares and you keep just the four corners. And then you repeat this over and over again. Um, yeah, so this, this set is uh, it's one dimensional. Um, it has positive and finite uh, Hausdorff, uh, one-dimensional Hausdorff measure, but it, it turns out that it's removable. And so this is proved independently by Garnett and Ivanov. Um, okay, yeah, so, so we can't hope for you know, this kind of statement here to be true without the rectifiability assumption. However, we can, make a, we can uh, consider a different statement instead, um, which is this conjecture down here, that removability is, uh, is equivalent to having almost every projection having measure zero. Uh, and like, this is consistent with uh, everything I've said so far, 
and also with including this Cantor set example, because this is, I guess, the, one of the standard examples of a purely unrectifiable uh, one dimensional set with finite um, H1 measure. So, by Besicovich's projection theorem, this, uh, this thing down here is true for the four corner Cantor set. Uh, okay. Yeah, so this is Vitushkin's conjecture. Uh, so let's look at at least uh, some cases where we know this conjecture is true. So the first one is that based on the things that I said um, at the beginning, this conjecture is true when the Hausdorff dimension is not equal to one. And by Calderon's theorem, it's true when E is a rectifiable set. Okay, and then uh, Guy David proved that this is, like, this is true when um, the set E has finite one dimensional Hausdorff measure. And then uh, Chavia Tulsa uh, proved that this is true when E has H1 sigma finite Hausdorff measure. And he did this by proving the uh, semi-additivity of analytic capacity. Uh, by the way, yeah, so I mentioned analytic capacity and never, you know, it never showed up again. We'll get back to that. Um, but here, here's an example of where it's useful uh, is in uh, this one here. Okay, and so based on what I have so far, it seems like, you know, we're almost done. We just need um, to prove it's true for the case when E is one dimensional, but does not have H1 sigma finite measure. But, uh, but actually this was known you know, way back that this was false. Um, so Matilla proved back in uh, 1986 that, that this uh, equivalence is false. And um, he didn't actually prove which direction was false. So what he did was he, so um, it's easy to see that removability is a property that's invariant under conformal maps, but this property of projections is not so these two things cannot be equivalent. Yeah, so that, that doesn't actually tell you which direction is false. Um, and then later uh, Jones and Murai showed that uh, the direction going this way is false. Uh, yeah, so we can still, so the other direction is still open. Like, um, so that's the question that is written down here. Um, so, I think this is all repeated from, yeah, so here's the definition of removability again. And here's the remaining direction of the Tushkin's conjecture, the one that is still open. And uh, to study this conjecture, like we can also consider a quantitative form of this. Um, and so that's this uh, inequality down here. Yeah, so this left-hand side is the analytic capacity right, that we saw earlier. And, um, this right-hand side is what's known as the Favard length of E. And this quantitative, this inequality here implies uh, Betuskin's conjecture up here uh, because this is, uh, if, um, like suppose this inequality here is true, then now suppose E is removable. Then since E is removable, this implies that gamma of E is equal to zero. If this if this inequality is true, and then therefore this like this integral here is zero, so it's this um, you know these things are zero for almost every theta, and so that's why this is a quantitative version of uh, the Tushkin's conjecture. Okay, so this was all background to state our result. So our result is so this is still a conjecture, um, but so what we have is some kind of lower bound um, on the analytic capacity uh, using projections. Um, so, yeah, but, so here is our theorem. Um, yeah, so this is also very complicated. Maybe I should just cross out the whole thing so you don't look at it. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, okay, so, so there are certain things to focus on. Um, like, so the left-hand side, so like I said, we want a inequality of this form where the left-hand side is analytic capacity, the right-hand side is something about projections. And so that's the kind of form our inequality does take. Right here, right. This here, like projections do appear, um, but in a much more complicated way. Okay, so you take a, you take a, any measure, a mu, and then you you push forward the measure by these projections p theta. Okay? Well, I, I never said that p theta is like projection and direction theta onto you know, some line l theta. And yeah. So you push forward this measure onto like every line, um, and then you take the L two norm of the density of that measure. And then you have to integrate this over some range of directions. Um, so that's what this um, expression is saying. That, uh, 
Yeah, we do get some kind of lower bound in terms of something involving projections. It's not as simple as the projections of E. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, so, so I have a remark here that um, the right hand side of one, let's see if I can zoom out. Uh, yeah, okay. Is that still? I don't know how visible that is. Okay. Yeah, so, so if you look at this expression here, um, like by Cauchy Schwartz, this is greater than or equal to this expression here. So, in other words, if, um, if the conjecture above is true, that would immediately imply our theorem. And unfortunately, the converse is false. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess, well, you can think of our result, you can think of our result as some kind of step towards um, Bertuskin's conjecture. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, so this is, so I've stated our main result. And for the rest of the talk, I'll uh, say a bit about how this proof works. Okay, so I, I broke the proof down into three steps. Um, the first step um, takes this expression that showed up in our lower bound. And uh, we bound that by this uh, left-hand side here, which is um, some quantity that looks a lot like the, like the standard of Reese one energy of the measure mu, except uh, instead of integrating over all X and Y, we integrate over all X and Y such that the difference is inside some cone. Um, with cone KS, I guess it's like, looks like this. Right, so in other words, we're saying that X and Y have to lie in a certain um, direction relative, relative to each other. Um, yeah, so this is our inequality. We, we prove it using Fourier analysis, even though there is no Fourier analysis here or here. Um, and then the second result, the uh, second, second step is um, we use this uh, technique in, in Marchikainen and Orponen um, which um, gives us a big piece of Elytra's graph uh, in the support of mu whenever this integral is small. Yeah, so um, yeah, that might not mean very much right now, but I'll say more about this uh, afterwards. And then the third step is um, is to put all the to connect all these things back to the analytic capacity by uh, by a corona decomposition of the support of mu. Um, and then using some like, very deep and non-trivial results of Tulsa um, to, yeah, to connect it back to the analytic capacity. Okay, yeah. So now uh, I'm going to say a little bit more about each of these three steps. Okay, so, so the first step, um, like the inequality I wrote above is, is this one down here. So uh, I'm going to explain um, how we prove this. And, um, and so here is a, a standard result about the Reese one energy. And so, so here I'm integrating over all, all points X and Y in the plane instead of just uh, these points who, like, that lie in some direction relative to each other. Um, this shows up for, uh, let me see. Yeah, so let me just go through this, um, this chain of calculations very quickly. Uh, and so first, um, here we, so this is the definition of convolution. Then we take, then we apply Plancherel, and you, we use the fact that the Fourier transform of one over x is itself. Um, and then we rewrite this integral in polar coordinates, and then we just use Plancherel again. Uh, so this allows us to connect this Reese one energy to um, to this integral over these L two norms of these projections. And this is used, for example, in or this is one way to prove a Marstrand's projection theorem, for example. Um, and so in our case, because we're not integrating over all these points um, in R2, we're only integrating over a cone. We change, um, we make the following change. We take one over X and we uh, replace it with uh, you know, one over X times the characteristic function of the cone. And then when you calculate the Fourier transform of this, um, you actually get like, something of a very similar structure, except you know, if this is the cone K, then it gets rotated 90 degrees. And when you take the Fourier transform. So then you, you know, so this thing changes, it has a cone as well. And so when you do polar coordinates, you integrate over only some range of directions. So that gives us uh, this inequality down here. And the reason it's an inequality now instead of an equality is because uh, actually in this step here, when we apply Plancherel, 
you have to be careful because we are applying fancy world to the convolution of a measure with a tempered distribution integrated against the measure. Uh, so you need to do some approximation arguments to, you know, to make this work. And when we do those approximation arguments in our case, uh, we only get an inequality. And it's, uh, I guess like due to the discontinuity of uh, the characteristic function of the cone. Okay, yeah, so this is um, how we prove this result. Um, yeah, later I found another proof uh, that doesn't use Fourier, but I guess uh, you get the same result in the end. So you don't need Fourier to do this. Okay, so the second step is this uh, more geometric step where um, we're trying to find a big piece of Lipschitz graph inside and the support of some measure. Uh, and so uh, we use some techniques from um, this paper by, by Marta Kainen and Orponen. Um, Let's see. So the idea is uh, you start with a all force regular measure. Right? That's what this is saying. And you assume that this integral here is small. And so this integral here um, is really the, uh, can I fit this? Okay, so yeah, I can't fit both of these. Right, so, so, you know, we had this Reese energy type integral, but we, we are restricted to a cone. Um, so if you just look at the inner integral of this thing, right, that's exactly this thing here. So we look at these inner, like this inner integral and we assume that it's small um, for, ev for me almost every X. And the claim is that if you choose these, this parameter epsilon correctly, depending only on S, which was the uh, opening, like the aperture of the cone, um, then, then actually um, your, your measure is supported inside some Lipschitz curve. Uh, and the idea, like the way to find this Lipschitz curve is to use the usual um, characterization of uh, Lipschitz as and having empty cones. So we want to show that certain cones are empty. So I guess uh, if suppose that some cone like this is not empty, uh, then the idea is to show that this integral up here has to be large. So let me say a little bit more about this. Um, so let's take a cone centered at X and let's call this KS over two. And so it's a slightly smaller cone. Suppose that there's no, there's nothing in mu like here or here. Oh no, suppose there is. Yeah, so we're, okay, suppose there is something here. Okay, then what happens is when we take the larger cone KS, it then, let's say this point is Z. Then when we draw this ball around Z, um, we can fit a relatively large ball um, inside the larger cone. Right, this radius can be at least um, something like a constant times um, what s times x minus c. Um, and so this entire ball is contained inside this cone. So when we integrate this expression here, it, uh, let's see. So so this integral is now greater than the same integral, but over this ball. And instead of writing x minus y, if you're inside this ball, like every point y in here, like x minus y is approximately the same as x minus c. So I'm going to replace that with x minus c. Uh, so maybe something like this. Okay. Um, right? But then this is just the measure of b over x minus c. And then um, by all force regularity, because we know the radius of this ball, right? this is bounded by like C1 times X times S and the X, mi X minus these cancel. So you know, if we take S to be some constant times epsilon, then we get this result here. Okay? And so if we take the contrapositive, that's, uh, this, well, then this thing is small implies that these cones are empty. And so we get a Lipschitz curve. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the step of the proof. Okay. Um, yeah, so we're trying to prove something about analytic capacity and we've talked about Lipschitz curves instead. Uh, so, so the third step will be to, to uh, relate this back to analytic capacity. And this is uh, by a corona decomposition. Okay, um, so here are the like, two theorems that we use as black boxes. Um, so like I 
told you earlier, you don't need to know the definition of analytic capacity. You only need to know this thing here, uh, which tells you that analytic capacity is, uh, is comparable to this quantity. You take some supremum over all measures mu uh, supported in E, satisfying some linear growth condition and satisfying this other condition. Um, so this is saying that the curvature of mu is bounded by, by uh, the total mass of mu. Um, and okay, so then, then you probably ask, what is the curvature? And my answer is you don't need to know that either <laughs> because, uh, because the next theorem, okay, so we want an upper bound on this curvature if we want to use this result. Look at what this next theorem does. It gives you an upper bound on the curvature. So I could proceed through the whole talk without saying what this is, but maybe I should define it. So, so here it is. Um, the R X Y Z is the uh, is the what is this called? The circumradius of um, the circle of the triangle you know, of these three points. I guess what is this called? Yeah. So you have this triangle X Y Z. R X Y Z is the circumradius, or one over that is what's called the Menger curvature. Um, and you integrate that thing squared d mu x d mu y d mu z. So this is the curvature of a measure. But like I said, you don't need to know this because uh, we have this theorem here, which gives us an upper bound on this thing. Um, okay, so let's look at the second theorem then. So the second theorem says that if we want to get this upper bound on the curvature of mu, um, then we need to um, do the following. So we want to partition um, the support of mu cross you know, positive reals in such a way that you know, you know, certain things are satisfied. And then we get an upper bound on this thing. And okay, so now you might ask, what is the sum? But <laughs> yeah, you don't need to know it because look at this next one. Because <laughs> okay, you look at the next lemma. So this is something that we proved. So we proved that the sum, which you don't need to know, is in fact bounded by something else. Okay, so you chain these two inequalities together and you get this down here. You plug this in and you do some calculations and it gives you the thing that we claimed at the beginning. Okay, I guess that's not very satisfactory. So I guess I'll say a little bit more about what's going on here. But at least this gives you an idea of how the structure of the argument works. Right? It's like uh, we have these two um, things that we use as black boxes. We prove something so that we can use these black boxes. Yeah, so, so what is going on here? Um, so when I say partitioning um, this set here, this is a corona decomposition. Um, so um, I guess the, actually, no, let me go on to the next slide where I say more about this. Yeah, but yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is explaining what's going on in that last part. Um, so we want some corona decomposition, or in other words, we want to partition uh, the set of all. Like, so we think of like, support of mu and positive reals. So like, if you have a point in the support, uh, if you have a point in the support and some R, you can think of like this point as representing uh, looking near mu like, or looking near X. Um, at scale roughly r. Um, and so we were trying to partition like both um, in space and also in the scale. Um, and and uh, the, way to, the way we do this um, is uh, using this dyadic lattice. And so that gives you a nice way to decompose like this <laughs> space that I drew here in some kind of dyadic cube like, framework. Um, and um, what we want uh, so if so, if you're familiar with uh, like the corona, corona decomposition used by David and Sems, like there they assume that um, your set or your measure is alpha regular. But we don't assume that. But so one of the assumptions, one of the uh, properties that we need you know, in this list of many properties, is that each of these um, stopping time regions um, is alpha regular. By, by which I mean that. Um, if you look at just these points at these scales, right, then um, they're dense, like then, um, yeah, then they satisfy some kind of like, upper and lower L force regularity um, bound. Right? Um, uh, or in other words, like the density on each, in each of these trees is roughly constant. Um, and then the second property is kind of familiar if 
uh, if you've studied corona decomposition before, right, we want an approximating Lipschitz graph. Um, yeah, and then there's some more properties which I won't say. Um, right? And then the sum that we that we say is bounded. So this is like some kind of packing condition. Um, right? So you know, the number of regions that we partition into, it's not too many. Uh, in particular, um, yeah, this this thing is bounded by um, this uh, Reese energy, like this conical version of the Reese energy that I uh, mentioned before, um, plus the uh, total mass of mu. Mm. Yeah, okay. Uh, so I, I'll say a little bit more about this too. So, so in my last slide here. Right, so the idea is that, so if you're familiar with these kinds of uh, corona decomposition, there's some kind of stopping time argument. <laughs> Uh, and in our case, uh, so we should stop when the density gets too big or too low. This is to uh, ensure that it is L-force regular on each tree. And then the third thing, so now here's where we use this conical breeze energy. Um, so if you look at this, uh, this expression here, right, it breaks up nicely into different, like, different space like locations and different scales. Um, and so that's like, what this kind of quantity is. Like if you have a dyadic cube, um, S, right? this is somehow like the piece of that conical race energy associated to, to this cube S. And um, we stop when like this quantity here gets too big because this, this allows us to ensure that inside each of these uh, trees or stopping time regions, the total um, conical race energy is small. And then so by step two, that, uh, that lemma, um, this, uh, this uh, kind of geometric um, argument here, it's a, so, uh, well, let's see. Um, yeah, so we want the Reese energy to be small in each of these stopping time regions. So we can use this um, result here to get Lipschitz graphs. Um, yeah, so condition three ensures the existence of Lipschitz graphs. Right? And if you remember, the reason we want Lipschitz graphs is because it's one of the things that you need for a corona decomposition. Okay, so uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. Uh, yeah, hopefully I give you some idea of how this proof works and I didn't cross out too many things. I thank you for listening.